Good morning and welcome to the Affordable Neighborhood Session of the Built Environment Conference. Um, my name is Hudeep Vega and I will be your moderator today. I work at the Health Department and I manage some programs on health equity. Um, today we're going to be talking about kind of the relationship between housing and public health and equity. And also some, um, our presenters today are going to provide us with some alternatives and options when we're looking at ensuring affordability within our, within our city for all residents. Um, so the relationship and the scientific evidence about the relationship between housing and public health is very well documented. And I would venture to say that the history of public health is actually rooted in the history in this country of um, affordable housing and urban planning. Uh, there was a point in the beginning of the 19th and 20th centuries when they were connected. Um, and so actually with housing, there are certain risks, uh, housing related health risks such as respiratory and cardiovascular diseases from indoor air pollution, um, inadequate Ventilation is also associated with a higher risk of airborne infectious disease and including to tuberculosis and also indoor pollutants and dampness are factors in the development of children um, for allergies and asthma. Um, also inadequate housing, you know, people suffer illness and death from temperature extremes and also other kinds of communicable diseases. Also, substandard housing um, puts specifically elders at risk of home injuries sustained within the home. So in San Antonio, especially on, within our inner city, I would say on the west and east sides, um, there's been a history of substandard housing and crowded living conditions as well as a lack of infrastructure. So some of the politics, when you look at the political history of San Antonio and particularly the political involvement of the African-American community and the Mexican-American community. Um, there were a lot of housing issues and neighborhood issues that were addressed and really kind of brought to the forefront changes within the inner city um, addressing housing, housing conditions of the poor. <coughs> so the history of redlining in this country also you know, establish some of those separations as far as poor health related to the living conditions and housing. And that has set the stage for continued inner city disinvestment, not within only San Antonio, but across the whole country. And as you know, we have segregated residential segregation related to race and economics. And that has created kind of this geography of health disparities that we have today, and that persists. <coughs> Excuse me. So we just wanted to make sure that within the context of San Antonio today, as we are talking about infill development and inner city, you know, development of downtown, that we not forget the populations that are vulnerable and that they also be considered because with their displacement, if they are moved and priced out of inner city neighborhoods and they move to other areas, then all of the issues of associated with healthy housing and healthy neighborhoods also get displaced. So that includes that right now in a lot of inner city neighborhoods, you know, you have a lack of, <coughs> excuse me, public space and opportunities for physical activity, uh, reduced access to healthy food resources. Um, it puts tremendous strain and social strain and psychological strain on families that are already strained financially to move them to another area. Um, and as we have so many transportation difficulties, so many um, people who don't have adequate transportation, who do not own a car, once you displace them to the outer realms of the city, um, it's just life becomes even more difficult. There's less resources as well um, as far as clinical care and hospital and preventive services um, for those populations. So it's just, um, so it's really difficult to kind of counter the needs in a city between development and the needs of our vulnerable populations. And 
luckily I think we're ahead of the curve. We're able to kind of maybe do it right as far as where other cities have not necessarily considered that and their vulnerable populations have been displaced. So uh, I'll just make it real quick. Um, our first presenter today um, is Christopher Lozaro and he is going to present on the missing middle which is in kind of a way to sustain affordable housing, an option within our inner city. Thank you. See if I can get this up high enough. Thanks for coming and thanks Sudit for introducing me. Um, if you were in the last session in this room, you've probably heard a statistic like this by now, that we have you know 1.1 million people coming to the metro area. A lot of them are coming by birth. A lot of them are coming by migration from other places. And of course, the question on all of our minds a lot of times is where will all these people actually live? You know, with a half million new households anticipated, we can't possibly accommodate all of these uh, families out in sprawling new suburbs, and certainly not without significant economic and environmental consequences. And frankly, nor will all of them want to live there. Really, six out of 10 people prefer mixed-use neighborhoods and would gladly give up a large yard in order to have a shorter commute to work. So it really falls on cities, urban planners, and the development community to manage new growth in a way that happens to be both responsible as well as desirable. So unfortunately, many have reached the conclusion that the only alternative to sprawl looks like what you see up here. While these are excellent projects that do meet a market demand, they aren't for everyone. Homes in these properties tend to have high price tags attached to them, nor do they provide the levels of privacy that some families still feel that they need. So if these aren't the only solution, and these development types can't continue to dominate what's being built, what do we do? As you might guess, based on the title of this presentation, we look to what we call the missing middle. So according to Daniel Parolik of Opticos Design out of California, Missing middle is a range of multi-unit or clustered housing types compatible in scale with single-family homes that help meet the growing demand for walkable urban living. So what does that actually look like? I guess before we explore the physical form of that, we'll take a look again at why that matters. So if we break down that growth that we're anticipating over the next 25 years into chunks that is a little easier to digest, we can look at it like this. For every 11 people that we add, we'll need about five housing units. And so an interesting dynamic that we're seeing across the country, and certainly here in San Antonio, is the number of adults that live alone. More than a quarter of our population lives by themselves as adults. And so what that really means is that we need housing units that are suitable for that housing type. In other, in other words, 60% of the new housing units that we'll need to build over the next 25 years will need to meet the needs of single-person households. And they really can take on many forms. So they include accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, and that's really just a fancy name for garage apartments, um, granny flats, attic apartments, basement apartments, or sometimes in San Antonio we call them casitas. And you know, we could do basement apartments if we had basements in Texas. Um, bungalow courts is another option. And these are really just small cottages that are centered on a single courtyard. Sometimes they have gardens or different amenities. Duplexes, so these could be stack units where one unit is above another, side-by-side -side units, which is probably more what we often think about with duplexes, and then even front-to-back units where you enter one through the front and then the other through the rear. We have uh, triplex and fourplex units which as the name suggests, these are um, with three or four units in the same building. And by the way, all these pictures are here in San Antonio, and so we'll come back to that a little bit. Townhouses, so these are attached units like you see here, or detached units. In fact, the house pictured on the left is actually the home that my wife and I live in. And then last but not least, we also have small apartment buildings. So these range anywhere from five units to a dozen, some cases a little bit more than that. And here are some examples of some newer versions of the small apartment building here in town. And the one on the right is probably one of my favorites with the clay uh, roof tiles and the matching planters. But really, missing middle 
has eight characteristics that really draw them together. Um, the first is that they're located in walkable areas. Um, because these older neighborhoods where this housing predominates is located close to the city center, they're often within walking distance of shops, um, amenities like parks, as well as to bus stops and other transit options. They're small, smaller in scale, so they allow them to blend into otherwise single-family neighborhoods, which really appeals to a broad section of our population. They offer levels of density that help support neighborhood retail and frequent service transit, but they don't fit the stereotype of high-density buildings. And we'll actually come back to this a little bit later. They're smaller, well-designed units. There's um, less off-street parking. Because, again, they're located in more walkable neighborhoods and they're generally well served by transit and um, biking infrastructure, missing middle housing doesn't need to dedicate as much land to parking as more suburban building types. Their construction tends to be simpler and although with uh, greater attention to architectural detail than most of what typically is getting built today. They also do a really good job at fostering community interaction and this could really be due to a variety of factors, but in part it's because neighbors here are less likely to come home in a car and pull into a garage. They're much more likely to see their neighbors as they come and go, not to mention the encounters they'll have as they walk to and from retail parks and on their uh, daily commute. And really lastly, they're marketable. I mean, really with our two largest generations alive today, the millennials and the baby boomers, they are really the two demographics that are driving most of our housing demand, and especially that for these vibrant, sustainable, and walkable neighborhoods where missing middle housing really is a perfect fit. So sure, missing middle housing has a lot going for it, but what does this really have to do with health? I mean, after all, that is the connection we're attempting to make here at this conference. For starters, more and more research is pointing to the link between suburban sprawl and poor health. And if you've lived in a sprawling neighborhood yourself, you probably know how challenging it is to walk from your home to really just about anywhere. And I know because I've been there. Here's the last apartment I lived in uh, before my wife and I bought our house. It's located uh, near I-10 and 1604, which is pretty far northwest of downtown if you're not from San Antonio. Um, and this particular property was just built about three years ago. And here it is on a map. As you can see, based on kind of the windiness of the roads, it's pretty tough here to walk to anything useful. We were more than a mile away from the nearest bus stop. We were more than a mile and a half from the nearest grocery store. But even if you were okay with the distance itself, it certainly wouldn't be a safe walk. So here was the route that I walked on more than a few occasions to the bus stop. So please don't try this at home. And here is actually where that bus stop is located. And Oh yeah, by the way, there it is, underneath those four giant uh, highway overpasses. So another connection to health is in our children's walk to school. The reality is that we now live farther away from schools, making it less possible for kids to walk or bike there. According to the National Center for Safe Routes to Schools, in 2009, just 35% of children living within a mile of school typically walk or bike there, compared to 89% of children walking and biking 40 years ago. That means all those kids you see up here on the screen in that light blue color are now being driven to school, which means they're getting less activity built into their regular routine. So put another way, more than 60% of children who would have walked or biked to school 40 years ago are now being taken to school in an automobile. And you know, here's, here's a local example of why that ends up happening. This is Patricia Blattman Elementary School located on 1604. And when I say it's on 1604, that is literally the only way you can get to this school is from the freeway. So I measured the distance from the uh, front door of this school to the nearest house, and it's a pretty reasonable quarter mile. Any young child could easily walk that. But unless your child grows wings, this won't happen in this part of town. In fact, when I tried to get walking distance from this address to the school, here's what I found. Sorry, we could not calculate walking directions. Thank you, Google. So another term for missing middle is gentle density, and it's really just a kind of a synonym, but it refers to neighborhoods that are conducive to walking and biking and transit use, but offers density at a scale that humans can relate to. 
So if we look again at these two examples, my old apartment on the left and a small apartment building in the King William District on the right, and if I had asked you before this session which building is higher density, I imagine most of you would assume that the West Oaks example is more dense, and it certainly looks that way. So West Oaks has 352 units on 16 acres, which I've done the math for you is 22 units per acre. And that's certainly not sparse. I mean, that's about twice the density of a typical suburban single family neighborhood. But this other property in King William, as small as it is, it has only 10 units, but is located on 0 0.06 acres, which that density equates to 167 units per acre. So that means that this building in King William is more than seven times more dense than West Oaks, yet it per fits perfectly next to other historic single family homes. So the last thing I wanna talk about is really the link between health and personal finances. According to a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, people dealing with the extended stress of financial difficulties are more likely to face health problems, ranging from digestive problems to high blood pressure to anxiety disorders. Further fueling the cycle is the link between financial stress and work issues, um, increased work absenteeism, diminished workplace performance, and depression. So ensuring that households have access to the types of housing that fit their needs at a price that reduces their likelihood of financial stress is a key way to promote better health outcomes. And the missing middle is one of those um, things that research is finding really can fit the bill. So the Center for Neighborhood Technology has created something called the Housing and Transportation Index, which builds on the understanding that households should spend less than 30% of their income on housing. I'm sure many of us have heard this before. But the Housing and Transportation Index looks at the combination of housing and transportation to get a better feel for household affordability. And that benchmark is 45%, as you can see on the left. So in other words, a household should be spending less than 45% of its total income on housing and transportation combined. Yet the typical household here in Bear County spends about 51% of its income combined on those two things. But for low-income households, not only are they experiencing problems with housing affordability, transportation costs are also taking a large share of their income. That means that low-income households in Bear County spend an average 63% of their income on housing and transportation. So really, they're only left with a third of their income for other things. So when we include transportation in our calculation, cities that are generally believed to be unaffordable to low and moderate income households are suddenly not so unaffordable. Let's look at this example. Here's um, the typical low income household in Washington, DC. The typical household of all income spends about 34% of its income on housing and transportation, and low income households spend about 42%. So they are still burdened compared to the typical household. However, as you can see, much less so than even here in our, in our own hometown. So providing alternatives to the car really ultimately frees up lower income households and really all households to use their income for other needs, including food, medical care, and education. And we have these neighborhoods here in San Antonio today. When you look at the 20 most walkable neighborhoods in this city, according to WalkScore, 13 of those are places where missing middle housing already exists. So yes, the missing middle is about housing, but ultimately it's about a lot more than that. It's about the context of an affordable neighborhood that welcomes these units that have been missing from newer development, particularly here in Texas cities. And it's about fostering community interaction in a way that the typical single family home does not. And lastly, it's about promoting movement in ways that increase our well being and even our lifespan. Thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot. I was supposed to ask you to stand up every time that you applaud um, because sitting is detrimental to your health. So next time, we'll all stand up. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Rodriguez. I work with NALCAB. I'm the chief program officer for uh, NALCAB. And my presentation is uh, around uh, equitable neighborhood development. So a quick overview of who is NALCAB. Uh, we are a national nonprofit organization based here in San Antonio. 
uh, we uh, serve a diverse et geographically and culturally diverse group of nonprofit organizations throughout the country that do asset building. Um, we have over 100 members throughout the country in 33 states, as well as Washington, D.C. And what we do for our members is we support them through grant making, technical assistance, we provide training and leadership development, and we work on policy and communications with them around asset building issues. Our mission is to increase assets for the Latino families and communities throughout the United States. We also work with other communities that live uh, throughout the United States. We, NELCAP focuses on three areas. We work in equitable neighborhood development, which includes affordable housing and commercial redevelopment. We work in investing in small businesses in our communities. And we also work um, in building family financial capability. So what does is, what is equitable neighborhood development mean? What do we mean by that? Uh, equitable neighborhood development can mean a different thing for depending on your role and who you are within your community. For example, a local CDC has their perspective as well as a private developer, a business owner, a municipality, a longtime resident of a neighborhood, as well as a newcomer to a neighborhood. At NELCAB, we acknowledge that there's different perspectives, and we try and find the interconnections or pivotal points where decisions are made that affect the community. And primarily, that everyone has an opportunity to provide input in the decision-making process. Equitable neighborhood development means that a neighborhood has accessibility to health services, to employment opportunities, educational institutions, transit options, as Chris was mentioning, in addition to affordable housing to all those living in that community, and neighborhood uh, businesses and economic development opportunities. So how do, we, how do we track or measure whether investment and development is equitable? Uh, for NELCAB, we use a framework, a framework of four different areas, and that includes people, families and singles that live in neighborhoods, their age distribution, race and ethnicity, income, immigration status, inflow and outflow from the community, veterans, etc. Place, uh, access to proximity, as we mentioned, uh, transit orientation, assets in the community to include parks, public transportation hubs, shopping, grocery stores, health services, etc. The quality of housing stock factors and also factors that depress the market. All of these uh, place-based issues have an impact on the health of community members. Our other uh, uh, area in the framework is economy, and that includes jobs and workforce match, small businesses, connection to regional economic engines, as well as the informal economy that exists in many of our neighborhoods. The fourth is culture, or cultural presence in a neighborhood. That includes demographics, history, language, the arts and cultural centers, centers of faith, sports, immigration, small business, and other uh, uh, components that make up the culture of a, of a neighborhood. So how do we understand the neighborhood? Uh, we do that by using demographics, uh, doing market analysis, market value analysis, uh, by looking at public and private investment mapping, asset mapping to identify what is available in the neighborhood, and create or, um, or support a vision for the neighborhood or the community. And then how do we evaluate change? And change can be, um, to any community, can be 
can strengthen a neighborhood or it can also lead to gentrification. A neighborhood strengthening is when a neighborhood increases in value and residents, all residents benefit from it. New investment in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods is a very good thing. We just need to make sure that all residents that have been living in that neighborhood benefit from that. Uh, improvements can include infrastructure, economic growth, um, new amenities, a new market base for existing businesses, and the key, again, is, is benefit to all. Gentrification, on the other hand, is when price appreciation of owner and rental real estate leads to involuntary displacement of long-term residents and long-term businesses. So um, key indicators of neighborhood change. What should we be looking for and looking at studying as our neighborhoods start to change in San Antonio? So we need to look at things such as property values and taxes. Are they, are they going up? Uh, real estate market activity. Is there a lot of sales, a lot of turnover happening in that community? Commercial activity. What kinds of businesses are coming in? Or are, are there a lot of vacant properties that are available for development? Cultural vibrancy, connectivity, and environmental remediation. All of these can create a, a healthy environment. And we do that uh, using GIS, uh, Geo Geographic Information System, so that we can visualize, analyze, and interpret the data that we gather about our neighborhoods. So what is an indicator of success? What should we watch? What should we keep an eye on? So as Chris mentioned a little earlier, housing cost burden to the families that live in the neighborhood is very important. Uh, permitting activity, is there an uptick on permitting? Code enforcement activity, real estate speculation, disreputable private market activity, and to what extent is market change being driven by the public sector or the private sector? and making sure that we keep an eye on all of those assets in our neighborhood so that we can pre preserve them. So what does success look like? Success is when long-term residents and long-standing long businesses remain in place, or no displacement. Um, culture is preserved in the neighborhood while revitalization and economic development is improving the neighborhood and is done so with community input in the decision-making process. So we wanted to take a look at um, a couple of, of examples of what other cities have done in order to secure equitable neighborhood development. Austin has gone through a lot of changes. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, displaced because of the, the rapid economic growth that, that they have uh, experienced. And so they have started putting, they have put in uh, policies and investments in place to assure equitable neighborhood development. Uh, one of the areas is public funding for affordable housing. They use their housing trust to support development and rehab of owner-occupied homes, rental housing development, acquisition of property for affordable housing. They also have passed a general obligation bonds in two different uh, elections, and that has seated uh, the city council, I'm sorry, that has um, provided affordable housing creation as well as preservation. The financial incentives for private developers in Austin should, uh, should follow smart housing policy. That's SAFE, that stands for safe, mixed income, accessible, reasonably priced, and transit oriented. Again, all those areas that we've been talking about this, this morning. The goals of smart housing include to provide waivers of development fees uh, to promote development of smart housing. They use public resources to leverage private investment. 
and therefore stimulate the development of housing on vacant lots in new and existing subdivisions. This is an effective way of using uh, city infrastructure and services in order to promote equitable neighborhood development. Permanent affordability is another area that, that they uh, focus in on and do so by the creation of a community land trust program. Uh, many of you know what that is, but uh, it allows uh, home buyers to purchase a home and lease the land that, they, that their home is built on, therefore removing the cost of land from the development and making it a more affordable purchase. This is a relatively new program for them. They have um, eight homes that have already been sold and they have several in the pipeline. Uh, another, another example in another state uh, that we wanted to look at was Philadelphia. So they have been using vacant land to promote equitable community development. And that's done through the Philadelphia Land Bank. Uh, here in San Antonio, you may have seen some recent articles about vacant structures, policy, and different things like that. And so this was one reason that, we, that we're bringing this example. The goal is to return vacant and tax delinquent properties owned by the city to private owners and productive reuse. Uh, they consolidate uh, you know, main, much of the land acquisition and the disposition process in doing so. And the land bank has the authority to acquire tax delinquent uh, properties through tax foreclosure. They clear the title and they make it available for development. Um, preserving affordability for long-term residents in changing neighborhoods. They have another program called Long-Time Owner Occupants Program. This is another one that uh, we can consider here in, in San Antonio. Homeowners with substantial changes in their property tax assessments can qualify for a discount in real estate taxes. The owners um, can have their tax bills reduced for 10 years. And of course, there's eligibility requirements, but something certainly that we should consider. So bringing us back to San Antonio and um, taking a look at the opportunities that exist today as well as challenges. Um, so um, local neighborhood change is happening. We know that. Some of our neighborhoods have already changed tremendously, and some of that has caused displa displacement. I wanted to mention a couple of statistics. We did some research uh, about um, some of the areas that we talked about earlier, including neighborhood changes in neighborhood um, income, in, in housing prices, et cetera. Just to give you an idea, for example, La Vaca has been under, has undergone changes since, geez, the 1990s, mid-1990s or even earlier. Um, the, the household income, we looked at 2000 and 2013. The household income then was uh, 19,628 as a median. Today, it's 32,240. And I bet if you looked at two more years, because this is 2013, it's gone up significantly since then. That's been a, a change of 64%. Owner-occupied housing values in 2000 were averaging about $40,000. Now they're, they're, in 2013, they're at $149,000, a 271% change. And again, I bet in 2015, they, they have gone up even more so. Um, the, other, the other area, remember, we talked about people. So race and ethnicity of residents we looked at, there has been a decrease in, in Latino families, Hispanic or Latino families in the neighborhood, while an increase of uh, Anglo or African American families. The, the other one we want to take a quick look at is Dignity Hill. That's, a, that's an area close to downtown, fabulous housing stock, has not seen reinvestment in many years. Now is starting to see um, investment. 
And so what's happening there? That's one of those communities that is still on the cusp that we can, we can work you know, with, with policies with the city in order to, to ensure that all residents can remain if they wish to do so. Right now in uh, 2000, the average income, median income was 17,121. Um, in 2013, it had gone up to 26,000 or an, inc an increase of about 55%. There again, the housing stock has been, the pricing has been going up, the value rather has been going up. Whereas in 2000, the average was 40,000 now it's in 2013, it's, it had gone up to 68,000. Again, a couple of more years, it's been going up since then. Again, looking at race and ethnicity of residents, it's been a traditionally uh, uh, African-American neighborhood. There's been a loss of about 33% uh, in, in, of African-Americans, while there's been an increase of Latinos and white in the neighborhood. So those are just some, some things, uh, examples of what to look at. So we have some opportunities here in, in San Antonio that we should take advantage of. Um, there's, there is a very positive um, outlook in terms of new investment in historically disinvest, disinvested communities. Um, what we need is the protections. And the city is moving forward. They have put together a city council housing committee that's addressing these issues. They have put together a housing commission that is also looking and addressing these issues. There's a consolidated planning process that's going on. Um, and so all of these are opportunities for us to get involved and, and make a difference. The challenges, we have a lack of a housing policy. Um, the city has not traditionally prioritized affordable or workforce housing. And so what is, where does that leave us? And that leaves us with, uh, I'll leave you with a call to action. And so how can we, how can, what, what does a call to action look like? What can we do as a community? Um, our recommendation is for the city of San Antonio to encourage community involvement in decision making by allowing the community to be informed, share their data, share their resources, um, offer opportunities for public input. And some of this is happening, for example, the, the consolidated plan, the comprehensive planning process uh, is, is asking for volunteers and input. For us as citizens to become engaged in public meetings, uh, attend these uh, committee meetings, commission meetings, attend the pl planning process, and make a statement about your community. Uh, be informed, do your research, and then uh, provide your public input. Thank you. Thank you for standing up. Okay, uh, we will take a couple of questions now. Yes, on the left. Okay. Um, actually, this is more like a comment, and thanks for the speakers. And um, my name is John. I'm with the City of San Antonio Development Services Department Zoning Section. I'm quite familiar with the zoning code. It's required for my job. But uh, one of the uh, functions that I do is just I consult with developers or simply you know uh, people who wants to you know build or rebuild or develop their land, and. Um, let me give you a quick you know, snapshot of the, the situation that we have. We have over 60 something you know, zoning code, zone, different zoning districts in our code. Only two of those um, can waive the, or doesn't require parking on site. And uh, so all the rest of it, you know, when somebody comes, even though they can build, let's say, triplex or you know, multifamily type of a development that uh, we will tell them, hey, you know, for each unit you need to have parking on your land, and that half of the time it, it kills the project right there. And the others that I've seen that I got involved with, uh, even though those two does not require uh, parking, but each and every project that I've seen over the years, every developer did provide parking on site, even though in downtown area. 
So um, when Chris mentioned about those transportation housing, you know, they, they go together, that's true. But, you know, the transportation side is not that easy to, you know, just take it out of the equation and uh, just make things more affordable because we're heavily depending on uh, vehicle or, you know, like cars and, and, and driving. So that's why we still have to require those, you know, parking spaces. I just want to make the comment. I don't have any further questions. Thanks, John. <coughs> Thank you. Ari? Good morning. My name is Ari Porter, and I work with the San Antonio Housing Authority Choice Neighborhood Initiative. And just had a question in reference to the 33% uh, loss that you had mentioned in reference to African Americans in the Dignity Hill. I just wondered if there was any information as to why uh, there is that decrease, and then if there are any efforts to try to recapture that demographic so that our neighborhoods are truly diverse. I, uh, we, did, we did some research using the uh, census and the American Housing Survey, and that's, that's where the information comes from. I, can, I do not personally work on the east side, and so I don't know of any efforts that are being made to, to, to bring families back to the community, but I can tell you through the um, Housing Commission and the city, the city housing uh, committee, we have an opportunity to put policies in place that will not cause further displacement. It, and you may want to check with others that work in the neighborhood to to get some more details. Well, I actually work in the neighborhood, okay. so. But I was just wondering if there is, so you say there uh, are policy commissions, so I'm just wondering if there is any effort to, you know, either <laughs> collectively, well, maybe collectively, to, to ensure that this information is being uh, looked at. Um, in those commissions? Yes, uh, actually I serve on that housing commission and we have several um, recommendations that were made by the, a previous task force for diverse and dynamic neighborhoods that we are working on and, and part of that is to take a look at um, all the city policies that may inadvertently cause displacement and make some recommendations to city council, which is where that housing committee comes in, very, very important, for them to recommend a passage of new policies that, that ensure protections for longstanding residents. Okay, I guess I was interested um, specifically in, in the African American population and that large percentage that is not there. And I know that um, with some of the choice efforts, the choice is, is mainly um, oriented around the redevelopment of the Wheatley property. Yes. And so we have a one-for-one one, um, mandate replacement uh, so that families are not displaced but are, are relocated during this process. But just really interested in that uh, large number for the African American population. Well, anecdotally, I'd just like to share that as a person who grew up within the inner city in San Antonio, there's a lot of people that are trying to come back and trying to maintain their family, their family housing, myself including. Um, so I meet people every day that are, you know, trying to fix their grandma's house or trying to, to move back right. um, because they were told in, in order to succeed, they needed to leave the neighborhood. And that is not the message that we want to impart anymore to our neighborhoods. Right. right, and I think incentives to, you know, incentivizing uh, people to return to the neighborhoods to fix up grandma's house might be worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, um, so my question is more for Mr. Liz uh, Lozano. Or Lazaro, sorry. Um, with, I'm not too familiar with Renew SA, but I was wondering um, when people speak of the um, expect or anticipated number of uh, families and individuals coming to San Antonio, a lot of them um, go to new housing. Oh, a lot of people think of new housing, creating new spaces to um, house these families, but 
I myself, living in San Antonio, can't even afford those housing, those um, new developments. So I was just wondering, is Renew SA, um, do they have any monies set aside to renew existing multifamily um, homes on the west side or the south side, the east side? Um, these, these places, they, they still hold families, but they're in dire need of repair. So I was just wondering if Renew SA had that in their scope. Thank you. Um, I know as far as Renew SA goes, we have a lot of money dedicated to owner-occupied rehab, specifically for single-family homes. Mm -hmm. But I know through this last uh, comprehensive, or sorry, consolidated planning process that we went through specifically for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, that um, some of our future funding over the next five years will also go toward um, rental housing. Oh, and I don't, I'm not entirely familiar with how that funding will be divided up, but mm -hmm. I know that that's something that's increasing as a priority for the city because of the new pressure that we're seeing on rental prices here in, mm -hmm. in the city. Okay, awesome, great, thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, when, you, when you talk about call to action, what can neighborhoods do about uh, gentrification and uh, eminent domain, especially when the neighborhood is against it and local government is for it and then with with that uh, i'm talking about you know lobbyists you know and, and whatnot you know what what further action can you take yes um the reason that that i well first of all let me tell you that i cannot address your question about eminent domain that would be someone else uh, unfortunately. Um, but in terms of uh, call to action, the reason that, that I was sharing with you some of the things to watch is because we as, as citizens or residents of, of our neighborhoods need to be aware of the different things that indicate neighborhood change. We can do our own research through, you know, census data. We can ask the city for data. Uh, there's a the, the permitting processes, for example, uh, you can tell the difference certainly when your taxes have been going up. Um, and so it's, it's, it's about identifying all of the different areas that uh, indicate change in the neighborhood and then being proactive to go to those uh, committees or commissions uh, to the city and, and advocate for policies that will protect your neighborhood. Thank you. Oh, I wanted to address that as well. Um, I have the, in my job, I have the unique position uh, to be able to be a government employee and also work with communities on organizing it to improve their health. So, you know, we're stuck between these two worlds and we see these both systems the way that they work. Um, you know, neighborhood voice and community voice is very powerful and there's many ways. Um, to be very organized in your approach to how you approach the city. And I, I think the city is responsive, but it's kind of the method and the manner of being intelligent about it. Um, you know, there's many ways of community organizing. Marching on City Hall, that makes a statement, but there are other ways as well to talk to your neighborhoods, to neighborhood residents, to understand the processes, the city processes, and how you really do have a voice as a community member. And the thing is, people usually aren't, aren't organized enough. So I, I, you know, we really try to get out in neighborhoods and tell people, this is your, this is your neighborhood. At the end of the day, you know, you have a right to be here. You have a right to live a happy, healthy life for you and your family. And um, you know, it's important to talk to your neighbors. No one even talks to their neighbors anymore. So there's a way. There's a, an approach to be organized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Walter Bowman. Uh, I would like to ask uh, a question to the gentleman in the middle and the lady on the end. The key factor in this situation is you said that there were a in-place rehabilitation plan to help 
peoples in this area of Dignity or any other area to revitalize their home. I'd like to know how can we get a hold to that information? And to you, ma'am, you said that you was involved with the policy situation. It's very important that a policy be brought into existence to support the senior citizen, the low income, the families of low income, a policy to develop a, a situation where they can acquire a very low interest rate on rehab, rehabbing their property, a half an interest rate, 1% uh, no more, or a grant made available for that level of generation of people. I guess to your question about um, Renew SA, there's really a few ways that you can get a hold of us. Um, we do have a website specifically for Renew SA. It is renewsa.com. Um, also, you can contact our office, which is um, at Planning and Community Development, and we're at 1400 South Flores. And so during regular business hours, we have uh, staff there that can work with you on um, determining eligibility for our um, housing programs. And so if you want to see me after, I can get you more contact info. Sir, to your other comment, I can, uh, I can tell you that the, the commission is, is a new commission. We have, uh, we're just about to have our third meeting, but we share a, a concern for, for the seniors and lower income folks, as, as you have mentioned. And um, I can assure you that, that those of us that are there are going to be looking at ways to address the issue, and we hope to, to be successful. Uh, we have time for one more question. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.